Good evening, and welcome to the Korea Society special webinar, Building and Protecting Your K Brand in the YouTube Era, co-hosted with COTRA, the Korean Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. My name is Tom Byrne, and I'm president and CEO of the Korea Society. Thank you for joining us this evening. The Korea Society is a nonprofit organization dedicated solely to the promotion of greater awareness, understanding, and cooperation between the people of the United States and Korea. Despite the unprecedented challenges of the pandemic, the Korea Society remains committed to furthering our mission by presenting informative and timely programs to our online audience. We are actively and successfully enhancing our digital presence by frequently releasing new policy, education, and arts and culture programs. We are pleased to welcome those of you that have been to our programs in person or online, as well as those who are new to our programs. I invite you to check out our podcasts, webcasts, and YouTube co content at koreasociety.org. Tonight's seminar provides in-depth conversation on brand management in the age of YouTube. The program will cover various aspects of YouTube, such as business platform, including legal issues on copyright, trademark, and advertising. The webinar series will also provide practical advice from Korean American YouTube celebrities on branding, content development, and viewer engagement. Before we get started, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our partner, Kotra, who helped this program uh, come together. Kotra is an investment promotion agency established under the Korean Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy, dedicated to ensuring that emerging enterprises have access to the global market. Tonight, Lee Ji Hyung, president of Kotra North America, will speak for the organization following my remarks. Now, let us welcome uh, President Lee uh, Ji Hyung, uh, president of Kotra North America. Uh, Ji Hyung, this screen is yours. Good evening, Abdurakis. Uh, I'd like to welcome and thank you all for attending this event. My name is Ji Hyung Lee, president of Kotra North America. Kotra is a South Korean government agency that serves startup companies and small to medium sized businesses looking to tap into the global market. We strive to promote international trade and investment in 84 countries. I'm in charge of Kotra's nine offices in North America, one of which is situated here in New York. Kotra New York's IT desk team provides guidance and international support to the US bound Korean businesses on their intellectual property matters. Korea is the world's fifth largest exporter, just after China, US, Germany, and Japan. In today's digital world, online marketing is essential for exporters, particularly in the post-COVID-19 era. With the rise of do-it-yourself culture, YouTube has become the second largest search engine in the world, with billions of users every day. More and more businesses adopt social media promotion using videos. A potential legal issues may arise. Kotra and the Korea Society put together today's webinar to raise awareness and help our constituents minimize business and legal risks while optimizing their international marketing offers. We hope today's program offers the means to exchange ideas and expertise and inspires our attendees to successfully grow their brands on the YouTube platform. Kotra would like to thank you for all distinguished speakers for joining us to share their valuable insights. We would like to express our deep appreciation to our co-host, the Korea Society, for collaborating with us on this important topic. For the first session, I turn to Kerry Bruce to present YouTube marketing, navigating legal pitfalls. I want to thank her in preparing tonight's lecture. Kerry is a partner and Reed Smith's LLP's New York office. She has represented clients in a wide array of industries, including beauty, fashion, retail, restaurants, media, and technology. Carrie offers guidance to her clients to effectively market their products and services while resisting risks and remaining competitive in today's business world. She's a frequent speaker on advertising, marketing, 
and social media compliance issues. Please welcome Carrie. And once again, thank you all for watching. We hope you enjoy the program. Carrie? Yeah, hi, thank you. Just share my screen. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I first want to thank the Korea Science Society and Kotra for um, giving me the opportunity to present to you this evening on YouTube marketing and navigating the legal pitfa pitfalls of marketing on YouTube. The agenda for this presentation will be twofold. So first, I will focus on copyright and trademark law. So brands that produce content for YouTube risk having their brand assets infringed. And if a brand uses third party materials in their content, they risk infringing someone else's copyright or trademarks. So I hope to help you understand the basics of copyright and trademark law. Um, also understand what is infringement, what are potential defenses, and what are the remedies that are available to you if someone is infringing your assets on YouTube. Second, I will discuss advertising law at a high level, including sources of enforcement, and then we'll focus on the basic rules of the road and best practices for influencer marketing. So whether you are an influencer yourself or you're hiring influencers to create content for you, um, I'll pro provide practical tips and approaches. So before I dive into the presentation, um, I also want to set the stage and share some high level things to keep in mind overall when marketing on YouTube or online in general. So we'll talk about some of these items in more detail. But first of all, you know, online marketing laws, um, offline marketing laws apply online too. So thus, if you shouldn't do it offline, you probably shouldn't be doing it online either. You should always review and understand the platform terms and conditions. So you know those terms of use and other user agreements you have to click and agree to when you register for um, YouTube or some other account. You should read them. And if you don't understand them, contact a lawyer or somebody who can help you understand them as, as they outline your rights and responsibilities um, as an account holder and for your use of um, that platform services. And we'll also outline um, how those platforms can use your content as well. Also, you should always obtain necessary consents when you use intellectual property that belongs to other people. And we'll talk more about this as I talk about copyright and trademark law. You should always know your own risk tolerance of your company. So this can impact the type of social media platforms you wanna be on and be associated with and also the type of content you produce. Every business has a different risk tolerance for legal risks, so know and understand what yours are. Uh, know your responsibilities overall, so whether it's compliance with certain platform rules or responsibilities with respect to your content. And then know what you um, expect of your vendors, agents, and advertising agencies that might be working for you. Um, and make sure they understand as well your expectations of them, who's responsible for certain legal clearances, if you're hiring influencers, who's responsible for monitoring them. Those should all be outlined. And then finally, um, something that people don't always talk about is consider um, talking to your insurance provider to obtain proper um, errors in emission and other insurance to protect you from liability for your, mar for your marketing practices. So now I'll turn to copyright. So the best way to describe copyright is that it's a bundle of rights. Copyright law secures for the creator of a work or an assignee of that original work um, that's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. It gives you the exclusive right to control who can do certain things with the work. So including reproducing, creative, der creating derivative works, distributing, performing, displaying, and licensing rights to other parties. The key with understanding copyright law is understanding the difference between an idea and an expression. So copyright does not protect ideas, only the expression of that idea in some sort of tangible medium. Um, and the idea must be original also. So an example of an idea versus, versus an expression is, so no one can own the idea of a TV talent competition 
but they can own the expression of that idea as a television show um, in certain features about that. So, you know, that's why we've got different multiple talent shows, you know, that are on networks now. You've got America's Got Talent, you've got The Voice. So nothing can prevent somebody else to from owning you know from coming up with a talent tv talent competition show as long as their their version is original and this is really important so the requirement of expression um, in a tangible form is necessary for the key objective of copyright law which is in which is to enable creators of new works to protect their expressions of ideas while permitting others to express those same ideas in their own ways This slide has a nice summary of what things are and are not eligible for copyright. Um, so as you'll see, I mean, there are some things that people naturally think of as being covered by copyright, such as books and photographs, um, music, but there are other things such as architectural works, pantomimes, certain choreographic works, sound recordings. Those are all um, eligible for protection um, for copyright if they're original. And then there are the things on the right, which are not eligible for copyright protection. So I already talked about um, how ideas are not eligible, but things such as, such as methods of operation, procedures, processes, these things also are not generally eligible for copyright protection. However, this doesn't mean that um, you could not, if you had, for instance, um, a bunch of procedures or methods of operations that you fixed in a tangible medium, you added unique descriptions and photos um, to that, you know, you were making a book out of this. So if you, that compilation though, of those methods of operations and procedures, if they had other original items with them, something like that might be eligible for copyright. So copyright um, attaches to your work once it's reduced to tangible form. Registration is not required, but registration provides notice and evidence of a valid copyright and provides for the ability to bring in action for copyright infringement and recovery of statutory damages. So you can still monetize a copyrighted work without registration, but to fully protect your work, you must register it. When it comes to creating a copyrightable work, um, it's really important to understand who owns that copyrighted work. And generally, the original creator of the work owns the copyright, unless it's a work for hire, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, there's a contract that says otherwise, or the work was created by an employee in the scope of his or her employment. Now, work for hire is a term of art. Um, and the Copyright Act enumerates eight items that are considered work for hire. So that's something that's com commissioned for use as a contribution to a collective work, part of a motion picture, um, a translation, a supplementary work, a compilation, an instructional text, text or a test or answer material, or an atlas. So usually you're not, most people are not um, producing something that would be a work for hire. So what you want to make sure is that if you're asking a third party to create a con um, content for you and you expect to own it, then you want to make sure that the contract expressly states that you will own the rights and that the party assigns all the rights to you. So this, call, this um, slide has some examples. So if an employee creates um, a work that's copyrightable within the scope of his or her employment, then the employer is usually going to, um, to own that. Um, if a company, for instance, hires a photographer to shoot photos and the contract does not address ownership, so let's say you just issue a purchase order and it doesn't have any terms and conditions with it that specifically talk about who owns it, then that photographer, because they're the one that created the photos, is going to be um, the copyright holder of, of the photographs. Um, if a company hires a production company to create a product video, um, if the contract says that the company owns it and that the producer assigns all the rights and deliverables to the company, then the company will be found to be the owner. 
Um, similarly though, if an art director and a writer decide to write and produce a video and they both make um, material contributions, then both the art director and writer will have ownership. So you can have um, multiple copyright holders um, have ownership in an item. And so if multiple people have copyright ownership into a work, then they both have the same rights um, to that work. So when it comes to infringement, a copyright owner can bring a copyright infringement action in federal court against anyone it believes has violated its exclusive rights. So the copyright owner must show um, that it has a valid copyright, and that's usually done uh, because you have a copyright registration, and then they have to show that the defendant copied the work. And to show that a defendant copied the work, they have to show that the defendant had access to the work and that the work that the defendant copied was substantially similar. And in some cases, this is really easy, but the reason um, showing access is really important is because it is possible that two people can independently create the same or virtually the same work. And if they do, if, if the, the, per, the other person that created um, something that was substantially similar than, than a person that created the same item, but they didn't have any access to it, so they could not have copyrighted it, then copied it, then they both could have copyright in their individual creations. So that's why access is going to be really important um, in proving copyright infringement. When it comes to defenses for copyright infringement, so depending on the specific facts and circumstances of the case, there are different defenses available. Um, this is not um, an all-inclusive list, but one defense that um, you know, is probably most common is fair use, and I'll talk more about this next. Um, you can also challenge the validity of the copyright. Um, so you could challenge that the person bringing the case against you doesn't really even have a copyright in that item. Um, there's also the defenses that you didn't copy, right? You created it independently without copying um, that person's work, that you had an, um, a license, or that it was innocent infringement. But innocent infringement is not going to um, be an absolute defense to copyright infringement, but it will sometimes reduce actual or statutory damages in certain circumstances. So fair use um, is often misunderstood. So when you use somebody else's copyrighted work, there's no guarantee that you're protected under fair use. Um, furthermore, adding things like disclaimers, crediting the copyright owner, posting a disclaimer like no infringement intended doesn't make something fair use necessarily. So fair use is a limitation on copyright ex exclusive rights. The Copyright Act sets out a non-exhaustive list of uses that may be considered fair use. These include criticism, commentary, parody, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use um, in determining whether something um, consists of fair use is a very fact-intensive analysis. Um, and it's decided on a case-by-case -case basis by courts. And it, there's no bright line rule of what is or is not fair use. It's, it's really a balancing act that courts apply. And courts um, consider four factors that are set out in the Copyright Act. So the first is the purpose and character of your use. So, so the courts will look at whether your use of that copyrighted work was commercial in nature and whether the use was transformative. They'll next look at the nature of the original copyrighted work. So is the original copyrighted work creative or factual in nature? Um, if it's creative, it's gonna be afforded more protection. And then they look to the amount um, and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And I'll talk about um, a, a, a copyright case um, study example that, that sort of talks about you know, how much you use of that copyrighted work. So, so did you work, use only as much of it as you needed to in order to um, make your commentary um, about that work? So courts will examine qualitative and quantitative considerations separately. 
And then finally, they'll look at the effect um, of the use on the potential market or, or for or value of the copyrighted work. So courts will consider the direct market harm for the use at issue. So, so did your use of that work somehow um, hurt the copyright holder's ability to market or sell their product? Um, and were there any other harms? Like, did you reduce overall the value by, if, if you use somebody's photograph um, in an advertisement without asking, well, now you may have hurt their potential to license that photograph to somebody else. So here's one example of a YouTube case. This is the Klein case. Um, and you'll see up in the right-hand corner, um, that it says bold guy versus parkour girl and the big, the bold, the beautiful re-uploaded. So you can look at those on YouTube because they're still up. So here in this case, the plaintiff was a filmmaker who posted a video skit titled bold guy versus parkour girl. And in this video, um, this bold guy flirts with a woman and then chases her through um, parkour sequences. So she's running all over town, jumping upstairs and over ledges. Um, and then the defendants in the case posted a reaction video. So the defendants were this couple, they had a YouTube channel, and they were just commenting and, and basically making fun of this video. Um, and when they did that, they interspersed between their commentary, they played portions of the video in the process. And they played um, over three um, minutes um, of the plaintiff's, you know, almost five and a half minute video. And the court in this case determined that the plaintiff's video, that use of the plaintiff's video was fair use. So that way, so, so meaning the couple that made this commentary um, video on YouTube did not um, infringe the plaintiff's copyright. And the court looked at the fair use factors. And when they looked at the first factor of whether the purpose and character of use, um, the, the court said, well, the defendant's video is quintessential cr criticism and commentary. And that is one of the factors that's outlined by the Copyright Act as, as you know, suppo is supposed to be fair use. When you're, when you're really criticizing, criticizing and commenting on something, that's something that's permissible under copyright law generally. Um, however, they also had to weigh the next factor, the nature of the copyrighted work. And here, the nature of the original copyrighted work is that that work was a creative piece of work. So the original bold guy versus parkour girl was a creative video. And so that, um, that factor weighed in favor of the plaintiff. The third factor was the amount and substance of use. And here the court found that it was neutral. So this factor didn't weigh in favor of any party. So um, the court said that the um, defendant used a significant portion of the plaintiff's work, but it was necessary to use that amount in order to, um, to properly critique and comment on the work. And finally, the fourth factor was the effect on the market for the copyrighted work. And so um, the court here found that this factor weighed in favor of the, of the defendant. Um, the court said that it was clear that the defendant's video does not serve as a market substitute for the plaintiff's video, and that anyone who watched the plaintiff's video um, would not decide to watch the defendant's video instead of the plaintiff's video. You're gonna get two very different um, sort of experiences by watching the two videos. So overall, the court decided that this um, was fair use. If you are um, using third-party um, copyrighted material, um, unless you're absolutely confident that um, you think that your use is going to be fair use, you should always obtain a license for third-party content. So whether that's music, artwork, videos, um, you should also keep in mind um, about having a written contract with creators. So if you're hiring a third party to um, create content for you, you wanna have something in writing, as I mentioned before, cause you wanna, you know, you usually wanna make sure that you're the owner. And if you're not the owner, then you also want that contract to set out specific license terms for you. 
Um, you want your creators um, to represent that the work is original if they're creating original work for you. And you wanna make sure there are other provisions such as indemnification for breach. Um, you probably want them to have insurance. And as I mentioned before, you're gonna wanna have your own insurance as well. So when it comes to protecting your copyrighted works, there are several options you can pursue, um, and these are not mutually exclusive either. So um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, requires that service providers like YouTube um, that allow others to post content on their platforms, that they provide a way to request removal of infringing content. Otherwise, the service provider can be held liable for copyright infringement. So you can um, submit a, a DMCA copyright takedown notice. So YouTube has um, a form that can be submitted and the form just requires you to describe um, what the item is that um, the copyrighted work that you claim has been infringed, a description of where you can find it on the website, um, and then a statement by you that you have a good faith belief that the disputed use is not authorized by you as a copyright owner or it's an agent. So meaning you didn't grant them a license. There isn't somebody who has authority from you to grant a license for your copyrighted work. And you also have to represent that their use was not um, authorized under law. So meaning you have to have a good faith belief that um, their use is not fair use. Um, and this is a really um, important thing to remember because this was an important decision that came out of a famous case called Lens v. Universal Music Corporation. Um, some people may have heard this about this case. Um, it's from 2016 is when it was finally decided. But um, this was a case where a mom had uploaded a, a, a video of her child um, dancing and in the background was a Prince song. So it, it resulted in a, a, a very um, prominent copyright case. So again, make sure you've really thought about whether somebody's use of your copyrighted work is fair use or not. There's also um, the utent YouTube content ID claims. So this is another way to protect your copyrighted works. So YouTube provides an automated copyright management system. This exists in parallel to the copyright takedown process. So companies that own qualifying copyrighted protected ma materials can issue claims. And again, not all um, copyrighted protected materials are eligible to use the content ID system. But if you are, then content ID owners can set content ID to either block other people from using their material, so it'll like black it out on YouTube, or it'll allow people to use your copyrighted material, but you can make sure that all the revenue um, you know, when ads are played against that material, all that revenue that go, goes to you instead of the person that posted your material. And then finally, there's also the approach of sending a cease and desist or um, litigation. And, and as I mentioned um, in one of my previous slides, in order to bring litigation, you must register your copyright before you can bring a claim. Um, but cease and desist letters, you know, asking people to stop using your materials and threatening litigation is usually a first step before people, you know, actually go and file a lawsuit. And one thing to consider um, overall in your approach to IP protection is, you know, think about the type of enforcement strategy you want to take, right? Consider and be realistic. Um, so you may have a video that you actually want it to go viral on social media, and you may not have a problem with people sharing, sharing your video, or you might. So it, it depends on what kind of content you're producing. It depends on what your enforcement strategy is. So think about that and also consider softer tactics, right? Um, before bringing a lawsuit against somebody, consider the ramifications of that because assume if you take a certain action and if somebody thinks that you're going overboard, just assume it's going to go viral because it's not unusual for consumers, especially if, if you know, somebody brings a copyright claim against them or files a, a lawsuit or sends them a letter for them to turn around and post it in social media. So I always advise clients to sort of think about their strategies. 
So now I'm going to turn to trademarks. So a trademark identifies the source of a good and service um, of a good and a service mark identifies the source of a service. And a trademark, um, you can trademark more than just a word or a logo. So trademarks can take the form of a color, um, a sound, sense, packaging, product, store design. Um, so it could take lots of different um, forms. And, but but the, the whole goal of a trademark is to identify who is providing that good or service. So you don't have to register your trademark to have rights in it. And this is really important to know. And this is why a search of the patent and trademark database is not enough to confirm whether or not you're infringing somebody else's mark because not everybody registers their mark. And so the patent and trademark office database does not have information on every mark you know, in the United States. Um, there are benefits to registration, such as the right to use the mark nationwide in the category in which you registered the mark, um, constructive notice to third parties, um, the right to bring an action in federal court, and potential recovery of trouble damages and attorney fees and other remedies. Um, when it comes to protecting your trademark, just here are some tips. Um, make sure your proposed mark is not already in use. Um, so conduct a thorough trademark search more than just the patent and trademark office. Um, make sure it's distinguishable. So choose a trademark that's, um, you know, considered arbitrary or fanciful, right? Don't, don't choose something that is descriptive. Uh, register your mark. So register your mark in your state, which will document the first date it was used. And then once you begin using it in interstate commerce, you can register it with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Always use the um, trademark or registration symbol. Uh, so use the trademark symbol prior to registration um, with the US Patent and Trademark Office. And once you obtain a certificate of registration, you should use the circle R mark um, to connote that it's um, formally registered. Marks should always appear clearly and exactly as the way that you've registered. So don't register a mark and then somehow change it and alter it. Um, use your trademark um, as, or service mark as a proper adjective too. Otherwise, you can lose rights to your mark. So um, a good example of this is Band-Aid, right? You don't need a Band-Aid. You need a Band-Aid brand bandages. So the mark should not be used as a noun or in the possessive or in plural form unless the mark itself is already plural or possessive. A question that um, sometimes is asked is whether you can trademark a YouTube channel. So yes, you can trademark the name, logo, or slogan that you're using to promote your YouTube channel. And this has its benefits, right? It gives you the exclusive rights to your brand and prevents other YouTube channels from using your channel name, slogan, or logo. Um, it builds a specific brand identity for your channel. It increases the value of your YouTube brand if you ever to decide to sell your business. Uh, it allows you to use the registration symbol to protect your um, channel and give notice um, to third parties. Um, and the best, if you are going to trademark a certain logo or slogan that you're using on your channel, um, you know, do it when your YouTube channel is already established and you're frequently creating and uploading videos. Um, otherwise, you would have to file an intent to use in your trademark application. So quickly, I'm going to talk about trademark infringement and defenses. So trademark infringement is the unauthorized use of a trademark or service mark on or in connection with goods and services in a manner that's likely to cause confusion, deception, or mistake about the source of the goods and services. And what is really key is this likelihood of confusion. So the infringement has to cause confusion in the marketplace over the source the sponsorship or affiliation resulting from the simultaneous use of that same or identical mark. And the tests um, vary um, from circuit court to circuit court, but generally they include um, factors such as the strength of the plaintiff's mark, like how well known is it, uh, the similarity between the party's marks, the relatedness of the party's goods and services. So, you know, you could have two different companies named Apple, one that makes Apple computers and the other one that's 
Apple restaurants, right? Um, if they're two totally different um, service industries, they don't look alike, then um, those two, the Pat Patent and Trademark Office could decide that those two marks can sort of live simultaneously. Um, they'll, they'll look at the defendant's intent, intent and the existence of whether there's actual confusion in the marketplace. Um, for defenses to infringement, like copyright law, trademark law has a concept of fair use. So there's the concept of nominative fair use, and this happens when you have a need to refer to a third party's goods or services. So this often happens with comparative advertising, media coverage, um, when an independent retailer is talking about how they sell a certain third party product in their store. Um, you know, the, the user, uh, and so for instance, like if a store was selling, saying that they sell Omega watches, as long as they didn't imply sponsorship or endorsement or that they were the only store that did that, then that's probably going to be considered fair use. Um, and the user uh, needs to only show that its reference was to the trademark owner's goods or services. And at, which, and at that point, the burden shifts to the trademark owner to show that there's a likelihood of confusion based on the use. And then descriptive fair use is when a trademark owner has a descriptive mark and, some, and someone uses that descriptive mark as a word or phrase to accurate, accurately describe something. So for instance, Apple computers can't prohibit third parties from using the word Apple to describe things that are Apple colored, Apple smelling, Apple flavored. So they can't own that word Apple when it's used to describe something that is Apple. Um, and so all of the, these types of uses are considered fair because there's no implication um, or sp of sponsorship or endorsement by the trademark owner. Other defenses are the lack of validity of the plaintiff's marks and the lack of likelihood of confusion or dilution. Um, here's another case, which you can also find on um, YouTube. So here is um, in the, the Naked Cowboy case. Um, some of you may know um, who the Naked Cowboy is. So the Naked Cowboy is a successful New York, seat, New York City street performer who dresses up um, as a virtually naked cowboy. So he's basically in his underwear um, and, and he plays guitar and he sued CBS for posting a clip of um, a soap opera episode that featured a strikingly similar um, naked cowboy character. And um, CBS posted this on its YouTube channel and, and titled it, The Bold and the Beautiful Naked Cowboy. And then they purchased AdWord advertising from YouTube for the specific search term, naked cowboy. Um, so that way, um, the video would go to the top of visibility on YouTube. The outcome in this case was that the um, court said that CBS's use of the naked cowboy as part of the title of the YouTube video clip um, was fair use, and therefore the plaintiff's trademark infringement was, um, was claim was dismissed. So the court looked at the fact that um, the only use of the plaintiff's registered word mark in commerce is the use of naked cowboy in the title of the YouTube video clip. Um, and this, the court thought, was fairly used by CBS in, in, as an effort to describe the contents of the video clip, not as a way to identify the source of the video clip. So they weren't trying to portray that the real naked cowboy was actually, you know, in the video clip. Um, and they said that the, it was clear um, that the episode source is that CBS and not the plaintiffs was the source because there was um, a prominent display of the Bold and the Beautiful title as well as the CBS logo. And the court also said that the purchase from YouTube of AdWord advertising for the term Naked Cowboy did not constitute use in commerce. Um, because the defendants did not place the term on any goods or containers or displays um, or associated documents. So the, the court said that this was all fair use. Um, it's important to note that trademark claims on YouTube, um, YouTube does not mediate trademark disputes between creators and trademark owners. They, their policy is that they encourage trademark owners to speak directly with the creator who posted the content in question. Um, if a resolution cannot be reached with the account holder in question, then you can submit a trademark complaint through YouTube's trademark complaint form. 
um, and YouTube will perform a limited review um, of reasonable complaints and remove content and clear cases of infringement. Um, the most common trademark complaints on YouTube relate to the use of third-party marks in the title, content, or description of videos, as well as use of third-party um, marks in channel um, and user names. So I'll quickly um, talk about advertising law and um, uh, social media um, and best practices when it comes to using influencers um, on YouTube. So we've covered IP issues. So um, talking about advertising law in general. So advertising law is a body of diverse laws covering consumer protection, unfair competition, misleading advertising, intellectual property, privacy, and publicity. So we're not gonna discuss um, in today's presentation rights of publicity due to time constraints, but you should just know that there is a body of law that prohibits you from using a person's name or likeness for commercial purposes without their permission. And every state, virtually every state has their own version of the law. Um, so just understand that that's out there and that's a topic for another time. But um, advertising um, law covers all advertising, and this includes advertising, promotions, publicity. So if you were to post a video running a contest or sweepstakes, that would also be covered in advertising law. Um, press releases, trade materials, all forms of marketing materials are considered advertising. Um, and YouTube advertising is held to the same standards of care and due diligence as traditional advertising. The sources of enforcement. So these are sort of the, all the different ways that um, advertising laws are enforced, or so the different bodies and regulatory bodies. So the Federal Trade Commission, um, the Federal Trade Commission, um, there's the federal enforces the um, FTC Act, and the FTC Act prohibits unfair and deceptive acts and practices. There is state enforcement by attorneys general or district attorneys. So virtually every state has what is referred to as little FTC acts. And they're basically very similar to the FTC Act and they also prohibit unfair and deceptive practices. And consumers um, in states, um, oftentimes the state laws permit consumers to bring class actions. There's unfair competition as a private right of action as well. So you have the Lanham Act, which is a federal law and provides a private cause of action for false or misleading statements. And then you have self-regulatory action. So there is an organization called the National Advertising Division. It's basically the advertising industry's self-regulatory body in the United States. And it provides a forum mainly for competitive challenges. So if you have a competitor that you think is making multiple false claims out in the marketplace, you, this is usually a cheaper and faster way to try to get them to stop um, rather than suing them in federal court. So the number one rule when it comes to advertising law is to be truthful and not, not misleading. As I mentioned, things like the FTC Act and um, little FTC Acts prohibit false or deceptive acts or practices. And this includes um, you know, when influencers are making statements on your behalf. You know, so these laws um, apply to people that you hire to talk on your behalf as well. Um, and advertising law will often look at what message could a consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances would take away from the content. And the advertiser's intent isn't relevant. Um, and an advertiser is responsible for the types of claims. So whether they're express or implied or puffery, you have to substantiate all of them. When it comes to testimonials and endorsements and working with influencers, so whether you're an influencer yourself or are hiring influencers, um, testimonials endorsements must reflect the honest opinions, findings, and beliefs of the experiences of the endorsers. Um, and the messages must accurately describe the endorser's experience and opinion. And um, they must be bona fide users or customers at the time the statement is made. And they must disclose the material connection between the advertiser and the influencers. Um, and this is really important, and this is where you see a lot of litigation and FTC cases around is when you've got um, an influencer who is talking about your product and they're not making disclosures of that material to connection. So when you're working with an influencer, when do you need to make a disclosure? Well, you need to think about, um, you know, 
what is the material connection and is there a material connection? So types of material connections include, you know, is the brand paying the influencer? Um, is the influencer a brand employee? And people wouldn't realize that that person's a brand employee. Um, did somebody get paid or incentivized to put post content online in order to get some sort of benefit, such as a sweepstakes or contest? Or did that um, influencer person receive free product? So, so did a brand seed product to that influencer, even if they didn't require that the influencer um, posts um, a video or commentary about the product, the fact that they seeded that product um, from an FTC perspective, the FTC would say that that needs to be disclosed. So always ask yourself, you know, would the relationship, if a consumer knew the relationship between that influencer and, and my brand, would that affect the credibility of the endorsement um, from the perspective of consumer? So what should disclosure say if you're working, if you're an influencer or you're working with an influencer? Um, the FTC prefers that you use um, hashtag ad or hashtag paid or hashtag sponsored. They don't want short versions such as hashtag spawn or thanks brand. Um, they don't, um, you know, they want to make, make sure you're making really clear and conspicuous disclosures. Um, the disclosures on YouTube in particular should be in or on the video and also at the top of the description. So not, you shouldn't have to click more in order to um, see the rest and in order to see the disclosure. And don't bury disclosures in a whole list of hashtags. You see people all the time in their posts with, you know, 15 different hashtags in order to try to um, get their videos to um, top the t videos or posts on social media to the top of the algorithm. But that, um, you know, that material connection disclosure that something's an ad or paid or sponsored should be at the very top and should be sort of separate and apart from other disclosures. And depending on the content, you may want to include multiple disclosures either in or on the video. This is a bit of an eye chart, um, but, and this can be found online. This is just a chart by um, the FTC that provides do's and don'ts for social media influencers, right? just sort of top line things to think about and ways to clearly disclose and, and not to use ambig ambiguous disclosures. Um, a quick couple of case studies, um, and I'm just about out of time here, but um, there are a couple of YouTube, um, famous YouTube cases um, one is um, Machinima, which was a YouTube network for video gamers, and they paid influencers to review um, videos of a Microsoft Xbox One game. Um, and what's interesting about this case is the FTC bought, brought a case against not only the YouTube network Machinima, but also Microsoft, because it was their game, and their advertising agency. Um, and, and what they found is that Microsoft and Starcom had policies and procedures in place to require that disclosures by their um, social media influencers, um, that, that social media influencers had to make disclosures. But what happened is Machinima ha handled the contracts with the influencers and did not pass along those requirements. And as soon as Microsoft and Starcom found out that um, disclosures weren't being made by these video gamers in their reviews, they immediately took action to try to remedy the situation. And because of that, the FTC just issued a closing letter and um, didn't bring consent order against them. But Machinima, um, has a 20 year consent order, which if they violate the consent order, um, there are civil penalties up to $16,000 for each violation. So it can be costly um, if you end up with a consent order. And then one of the most recent, um, a very recent um, in the last couple of years cases is um, the FTC brought a case against two influencers and owners of CSGO Lotto. And they, the owners themselves, posed as um, uh, players on their gambling site and urged others to use the service and didn't disclose that they were owners. And the FTC found that that was deceptive, and they also ended up with a consent order. Two other quick um, uh, points here is the YouTube notification requirement. So if your video contains paid promotion or product placement, 
you're supposed to go in your advanced settings um, on YouTube and check the box that the video contains paid promotion. And it's, it's basically a content dec declaration. And so it, um, this is another reason you should review the terms conditions of websites. So you're supposed to mark your video. And then um, there's an option for it to have an added disclosure on your YouTube video. So um, see where you on the slide where it says includes paid promotion. You don't have to check that box, but it is something that you can add as well to add an, an additional disclosure. But just note that adding this feature alone does not necessarily meet the FTC disclosure requirements. So potential liability for violations of the FTC Act. So if you, you know, for instance, if you're working with um, influencers and they don't make proper disclosures, that's going to be considered a violation of the FTC Act. So who can be liable? The advertiser themselves, the agency, and the influencer can also be liable. And what's at stake here is your reputation. There's the potential for negative pub publicity, litigation, investigation costs. So even if, you know, you don't end up with a consent order, just dealing with investigation costs can get expensive. There are potential for civil, civil penalties, damages, and consumer redress as well. And then just finally, just some key takeaways here is just ensure all of your content has effective disclosures and is truthful and not misleading. Um, educate influencers if you're working with them, help them understand what, you know, what requirements are required of them with regards to um, disclosures. Train your business partners, um, you know, make sure you screen your influencers and that you have moderation programs to monitor their activity. Um, and, you know, if they're not complying with your programs and your, um, their contracts, then that you um, have um, consequences for non-compliance. And that's all I have. Um, I wanted to thank the Korea Society and COTRA again for this opportunity. Um, if you have questions, I can be reached via the contact information on the screen at my email address. Um, and I hope you'll stick around for the next session, Practical Insights from K-Brand YouTubers, which is coming right up. And I wanted to let you know that the recorded webinar will be available through Korea Society's and Kotra New York IP desk YouTube channels. So if you enjoyed this evening presentation, I encourage you to share it with your colleagues and friends. Um, and thank you again. Skincare should be easy, skincare should be a stress-free zone, skincare should be a supplement to our lifestyle, and most of all, skincare basics should be basic. Great skin doesn't start with any one miraculous cream or a complicated skincare solution, but with one little secret. It begins with you. So take the time to breathe, sweat, and fuel your body. Make the space to listen to yourself, tune out the noise, and tune into your cravings. Only then can you create a perfect skincare routine that works with your skin, not against it. Hi guys, I'm Songgyang Long Guest. Welcome to Asian at Home. So welcome to our second session focusing on practical insights from K brand YouTubers with MJ Choi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Sun Kyung, longest. Hello, everybody. And Leah Yu. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Zena Kim, and I'm in charge of litigation and operations at a &E Networks. We are the home of LivePD, the History Channel, and Lifetime. 
Storytelling through the lens of a camera fascinates me. So I'm super elated tonight. Lot to share on how to build a business and brand on YouTube. As a quick roadmap from our panelists today, you will hear their personal story and their journey, how they defined their target audience and marketing strategy, their magical creative process, and how they keep their brand going within the confines of law and compliance. So we're gonna connect this webinar to what Carrie had shared for the past hour in this webinar. So first of all, I just wanted to thank you again, Leah, MJ, and Sun Young for joining us tonight. Let's kick it off with some quick, quick facts. Tell us your name, your brand, your number of subscribers on the channel, and on average, how long does it take for you to create a video? Um, let's start with MJ. Hello, uh, everyone. My name is MJ. I'm the founder and director of File of Dance. Um, currently, my YouTube channel has 275,000 uh, subscribers. And because I'm a uh, dance, uh, we have a dance cover team. Normally, we gather up uh, for rehearsals uh, four or five times during the week, have one to one and a half hour rehearsal. So I would say total of five to six hours rehearsal is required. After that, uh, filming takes about two to three hours. Um, when your dance video came out, <laughs> I really wanted to break out and start dancing. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move over to Leah. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Leah Yu. I've been doing YouTube for quite a while now, and I have just surpassed 1 million subscribers, so I got the gold button just recently, and I mainly share skincare content and how to take care of the skin. Um, for me, I do work with research assistants who's dissecting the medical journals and researching more about the science behind skincare, so that itself, the research process and the content planning process would take about two weeks. The actual filming would only take two to three hours, and the post-production, like the editing and the designing takes about a week or two. Wow, so much work goes into a, a very short clip that we all get to watch. Yeah. <laughs> all right, um, Sun Gyeong. Hello everyone, I'm Sun Gyeong Longast. I have 1.5 million subscribers on YouTube and overall the social media in my website to get over 5 million followers. And I mainly do Asian recipes on my channel. And um, uh, usually when I'm filming, actually behind the, the scene of filming actually takes longer because I have to go through the recipe testing before I actually film the recipe and share with the world because I want to make sure my recipe is actually the standard of what I'm expecting <laughs> to stay delicious. And so, yeah, so a lot of people actually tried my recipe at home and especially this COVID-19 during this quarantine time, a lot of people taste my uh, recipes and they really enjoy cooking at home and I'm so happy to be part of it. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm actually, I've browsed through your channel and I'm looking forward to trying out the dumpling soup recipe. <laughs> awesome. So, um, Let's get a little personal. Um, let's take some time to have you tell us your story and your, uh, your philosophy around your business and your brand. And I guess the big question that I really wanna ask is how did you discover your strength and talent that is only unique to you? And I'm going to put the mic over to Leah to get started. Oh, that's a pretty tough question. Um, I think there's a multiple factor and the more you practice and the more you do the video making, I think you get better at finding and identifying what you're good at and what resonates best with your community and the audience. I think for me, for the longest time, I haven't found like what my true personality is on YouTube until I started dissecting like a very complicated skincare science into a very easily digestible information. I think that's where my like 
me as a person, I'm really nerdy. I can be very nerdy. I go deeper into the subject, but I'm also passionate about making things simple so that people can benefit from what I have learned and what I have found. So I think that's my unique strength that I found throughout doing YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll jump over to Sungkyung this time. Well, I actually agree a lot with what Le Leah has to say. Also, uh, being really genuine and true to yourself is also very important. And I would say being very transparent, um, very honest with yourself and what you're putting it out there is very challenge be yourself and actually putting out there to the world. And so a lot of our YouTubers or a lot of people actually having completely different personality on YouTube and in real life because it's completely different world. And the best part of social media, you can chop it up and edit whatever you want to put it on out there. You know what I mean? So being yourself and vulnerable being out there is actually the one of the, I always say the toughest thing I'm still fighting to be that way. So that's really, really tough. And as a recipe developer and a recipe uh, food blogger, I need a lot of inspirations from my own that coming from me, coming from inside of me and also from outside what other people wanted to see and the balance, finding the balance in between what I want to share and what other people want to see from me, the, finding the good balance is also that I'm still working on. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a follow-up question for you, Sun Kyung. How did you get into food? So I moved, to, moved from Korea to America <laughs> and uh, that was 2009 and when I moved, that was 2009, and I, we just happened to live in a small, tiny town in Mississippi. And so I didn't have any friends or family there, and the culture was completely new to me. I had to learn all the language. But, so I started cooking, and I, spent, I started spending time, a lot of, I was spending a lot of time at home cooking, cleaning the house. And at the time, I actually started watching a lot of YouTube videos as well. And because at the time it was like a pioneer of YouTube time, 2009, 2010. So I was like, oh, why don't I just kind of share what I'm doing here too? So that's how I started YouTube. I, w I, I was hoping that you were going to say, oh, I went to cooking school and this was the, this was no. my path. I've been doing this forever. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. Um, I had a follow up question for Leah. Um, before, so how did you actually get into like skincare? Yeah, so I started my YouTube channel when I was in senior year in college and I, des I actually majored architectural design, interior design. And I think as, you know, uh, I went to a university in Korea, women's university in Korea. So when you are in your early 20s, you're really interested in beauty products. And my school was the hub or the mecca for all of the new beauty brands to launch their store, open up their stores. So it was almost like a testing like beta like spot. Um, so that naturally got me intrigued. And then I, after college, I did a complete pivot from my major and I got a job in a more Pacific HQ. So I think that's when I started um, building and developing a huge passion for the beauty industry itself. And I myself have struggled a lot with acne. And if you do have problematic skin, you naturally get really uh, deeper into how to fix your skin. So yeah, that was my starting point. Fantastic. All right, MJ, I've been waiting to hear your story because you're a little bit different compared to everybody else. So tell us your story. How did you discover your strength and your talent and how you jumped into this space? Uh, so um, being on YouTube actually came in, uh, started very <clears throat> unexpectedly. Uh, I started my dance uh, class in 2006. So even now, that's my primary job to teach students and perform and 
organize uh, performances and stuff like that. And uh, 2011, um, one of my students actually suggested, oh, there's a dance cover contest we should enter. So I purely did it uh, as just fun activity. So I had zero idea of uh, making YouTube videos, anything like that, but I just did it because one of my students, and the dance contest, the dance material was what we were teaching that month. So for me, like, oh, we learned the dance already, so why not, let's make a dance cover video. Um, so, uh, but the interesting story here is um, the dance cover video, the deadline, uh, I submitted like a day before the deadline. So I didn't really have any expectation to win the contest, but then my concept was very unique. Instead of filming in the studio or at home, I used background uh, Times Square and Grand Central as a background. So kind of showing uh, the unique uh, view of New York City. So very quickly I picked up the view and I ended up winning first runner up uh, for the contest. So, so like, out of, as I submitted my video, at the end, of like very close to the deadline, uh, there were a bunch of other videos out there already got so much view because the, having a lot of view was very important for the contest. So for me, I was like, oh, it just, I, it's meaningful that I did it. But then I was so surprised, like in one night, I had so much view and I, I became the first runner up. And during that time, I found my passion and talent. Oh, I'm very good at coming up with ideas and organize things and having rehearsals and directing and editing all, all those things. So that's when I found that um, I have uh, a lot of passion in making these videos because it's just so awesome that you brainstorming and uh, you have a lot of different ideas and at the end it comes out as one product. Like it, I'm sure Leah and Sang Gyeong, they also feel the same way. Like you're writing into paper, oh, this is what I'm gonna do. And then at the end it comes out as a awesome video and having a lot of people watching it and they like it and they give you comments, just it's a very fun uh, process. So I instantly fell in love with it. And I also found, okay, I'm actually good at this. Why don't I continue? That's how I started. That's so inspiring because all three of you are really sort of telling the audience that you kind of have to experiment to figure out what your passion is or your true talent is until you actually make it. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, why don't we pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about audience engagement and marketing of your brand because it's a challenging and evolving process. So of course, we all want to get to know your know-how. Let's start off with um, how did you define your target market and when did you actually do that? And if you can also uh, share some challenges and opportunities that came up in that space, I think the audience would really appreciate it. Um, how about we start with Sun Gyeong this time? Um, I don't think you can actually really choose the audience, to be honest. You can aim who you want this group to be watching your video, but it's, it's out of your control, to be honest. When I put my contents out there, I wanted to, a lot, I wanted a lot of, um, I would say the people who didn't growing up eating Asian or Korean food um, as their, um, in their life. But then it happens to be a lot of Asians and Korean people are watching my videos. So you can definitely aim in who you, who you want to like targeting to, but then when you're putting the contents out there, it's like you don't have a choice anymore because a different groups of people might react to so much more than the audience you targeted. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I, I think you already sort of ch shared the challenges and the opportunities. And mm -hmm. I love how you responded that sometimes you can't really define that upfront. So why mm -hmm. don't we check in with maybe Leah or let's start with Leah to see if she had a similar experience with you where everything you, you know, it's out of your control. And so you just have to go with it. Let's see if Leah had something similar. 
Yeah, I do agree um, in a way that you can only attract certain people and you can't really expect them to come to you, even though that you set out to attract those specific target group. Um, but I think with the very specific content that you are creating, if it is made for a very specific group of people, you have a better product market fit, which attracts the exact demographic that you are targeting. So for me, it was mm -hmm. a lot of trials and errors at the, in the beginning. Like I started reviewing just like random new K-beauty skincare or K-beauty like mm -hmm. cushion makeup products. And that just attracted just like general people who's like kind of interested in makeup, kind of interested in skincare, but not really invested in it. But once I started creating videos more about how to clear acne, like how to do this and that for acne and focus really into acne skincare, I think that's when a lot of the people who are who have acne, who have been very overwhelmed and tired of trying literally everything. So this was, my channel was almost like a last resort that they have visited and almost found the cure or the way to take care of their skin for acne. So I think it took me two and a half years to figure out like who I'm speaking to and who needs my content the most. So yeah. Gotcha. I also, um, I love that there's also a food component to your your brand, Leah. Um, and it got me thinking about Song Top content too, because you're also, you can speak for it a little bit later, but I love that you also have that food angle when it comes to skincare. So it's yeah, quite dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's shift over to MJ. And if you want to tell us, did you have a target market or did it just come the way it did? Um, and what were some of the challenger opportunities? In my case, um, in my case, it's pretty obvious. My YouTube channel is mainly uh, doing K-pop dance cover. So very obviously, uh, a lot of K-pop fans will be naturally my audience. So. Uh, I didn't have to kind of look for who I need to target. It's just kind of, it was just naturally out there. Um, uh, challenge, challenge wise, because I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with what K-pop dance cover <laughs> means. Uh, so let's say Blackpink came out with one dance. Then there are a bunch of K-pop YouTubers, dance cover channel like me. We're all covering the same dance and music. Um, so the, the content don't belong to us. So the copyright issue is definitely challenging for us. So almost, we just have to give up on it. <laughs> and, um, also because like I mentioned earlier, uh, I would say more people will be interested in skincare and food in general, but K-pop is very like specific, uh, area. So my audience is already in a very small group. In that small group, I have to attract people to see my video. So that's actually a pretty challenge for me. And my personal challenge is uh, because like I mentioned earlier, I even now I don't look at myself as a professional YouTuber, not like Leah and Sungyo. I don't, my content, I just upload it once in a while. I've been very lazy. But reason why is because I'm also like uh, having like three different location dance studios and that was, has been my very, very biggest challenge because um, running business at the same time, I do want to take care of my YouTube channel, but you guys know it requires so much work. So putting those together was, it's really hard. So that has been my personal challenge. I think you're being humble, MJ. <laughs> There are different types of, you know, products we're putting out there. And I think with Songgyong and Leah, you guys are, you ladies are the talent of your product. And MJ, you're the mastermind behind your product. So they're different. I think they're just different um, business brands that we're getting to explore today during this panel. So let's, um, let's pivot and talk a little bit about marketing and some analytical tools. The first question that I want to throw out is, like MJ had mentioned, how do you leverage social media platforms in addition to what you're already doing? 
a lot that you're already doing on the YouTube channel. Song Kyung, do you want to jump in? Well, I use analytics actually um, all over the social media or the social media actually give you the information that you need to know. And I do use to see who is my audience and where they are. It's also very important and how long they watch my videos. That's also very important. So you know where to put real information, the really uh, important information uh, before that people used to leave, most of people leave. So um, based on the numbers, I have uh, uh, experimented and the length of the video or the frequency, how often do I uh, upload the video and what video people stayed longer or what type of cuisine or what type of a recipe, either traditional recipe or like easy recipe. So I use analytics to figure out all those, what my audience wants, because it's very clear number to uh, show you that. And um, overall, the analytics are very important. And I've been using as a really important tool for myself as well. But I have been doing this for a long time because um, I started doing YouTube like 2011, 2012. Um, so for a long time, and I normally go with my guts as well, not only based on the information or the data that they give to you, but like your guts, like what you want to do or what you believe this will be helpful for people. Like example for during this quarantine time, I did a lot of recipes that assuming uh, people will have uh, these ingredients in hand in their pantry or the refrigerator, like because I saw in many different grocery stores, those items were sold out. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that people will have that ingredients. So I create a lot of those ingredient uh, um, recipes based on those ingredients. So yeah, um, data is important, but same time, you need to listen to your voice. Thank you. Um, how about Leah? Yeah, um, if we're talking about like how to manage like multiple different social media platforms, like it is definitely challenging if you don't have a team, especially and if you're not doing YouTube full time or a content creator job as a full time. Um, for me, I also do have another skincare company. So that keeps me busy most of the times. But I'm lucky enough to have an assistant who's able to um, kind of create an editorial content calendar for my YouTube channel. And also Instagram, I think Instagram and YouTube can go hand in hand where you can repost and repurpose the same content. But then um, on Instagram, it's more of a visual thing and more aesthetically pleasing, um, I guess, content that needs to go up that resonates more. And I've been in, I've been experimenting more with TikTok nowadays and that platform is attracting a completely separate and very unique audience as well. So even if I am repurposing the video or creating original content for TikTok, um, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm really surprised that it is generating new traffic to YouTube as well. So it's been, it's been fun. <laughs> it's amazing how everybody's, everybody has to stay on top of the next platform. <laughs> so that's, sure. that's, that's fascinating that you discovered a completely new audience. Um, MJ, how, in your space, how do you use social media? Um, to be honest, this is my um, weak point. <laughs> I haven't been uh, doing so much of promotion for my videos, YouTube channels. Um, but uh, what I normally do is I, it's very simple. Uh, I haven't looked at any analytical tools offered by YouTube because I wasn't really too serious about it. But, so I'm thankful how many views that I'm getting with my videos. I don't do anything about it. So I'm very thankful. But normally what I do is after uh, creating a content, I share, like we uh, I try to combine Facebook and uh, uh, Instagram. Uh, we do have TikTok channel because it's huge at, at this time, but I haven't been looking into it too much, but I, do cre I did create a, a TikTok channel too. Uh, so those are the platforms that I'm using to promote my videos at the moment. 
but uh, I haven't been getting any professional help from, <laughs> I do have my team, but we were busy doing other stuff, but, but in the future, I'm, work, I'm working on it. <laughs> I think um, both MJ and Leah had sort of mentioned a topic area that we're gonna get into a little bit later about delegation and outsourcing. And it's, it's fascinating to hear that that came up right now in order to help you manage all the social media platforms. Um, well, let's, let's take a step back and actually go back to your YouTube homepage, the YouTube channel homepage. There are a couple of different pages on there. And if you just want to walk us through how you decided to create your landing video versus how you engage people on the community page and what is your strategy on bringing in partnerships to make that the entirety of your brand. MJ, can I put you back on the spot? Yes. Uh, for me, um, uh, uh, having a YouTube, you, for in YouTube channel for me, like uh, like interacting with audience is, has been a little bit difficult. I would mention uh, my dance cover video. The dance cover video that I make is normally to present the work and not so much of communication. Like we don't expect people to ask, oh, how did you come up with a dance vid video? Something like that. For example, let's say it's a food channel. I'm curious, oh, where did you get the stuff? How, how many minutes do I have to do this? There is a chance a lot of audience will come up with ideas. So I believe there will be more uh, intellect. You will intellect more with your audience. But in my uh, channel, uh, from my experience, most of comments that we get is, oh, I love it. I love your outfit. I love your background. Your dance team is nice. It's very much about their commenting how they feel about my uh, content. So there wasn't much in interaction going on with my audience. Um, so that's my honest confession that I have been doing it well. Um, but uh, I think it's really important to do it. So I'm trying to catch up on now. So that has been my experience. Yeah. Have you, have you had any of your audience actually give you ideas about the next cover they want you to create? Definitely. Uh, that, would be, that would be the only case they actually want to uh, feedback from us too. Like, oh, I love this video. Can you cover this next time? So yeah, in that case, we definitely look into the videos and try to make that happen and definitely take it to the uh, consideration. So yeah, that happens time to time. Cool. And do you have any current partnerships, dance studios or choreographers that you sort of market on the page as well? Or is that something that you just kind of do behind the scenes? Uh, at the moment, I'm just working on my own, but uh, I'm looking into having more collaboration in the future. Uh, but at the moment, it's, it's just on my own. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, let's head over to Sun Gyeong. How, tell us your know-how about how you've designed the home versus the community versus the partnership page on your channel. Um, I don't really separate those. I really think the social media, the strong, strongest part and the best part of social media, why people follow other people is that they can see the person next door, what they use, what they eat, what they do. Um, so actually being as a real is really important. So I don't really try to partner with other companies or other brands, not much really. I don't do much of collaboration either because unless people are asking me to do the collaboration and that if I can make that happen, I do it. But I just try to do really still try to build my brand more stronger as more defined and vivid color what it's supposed to be. And just because you have a strong social media followers doesn't mean you really have a strong brand. I mean, you cannot have a strong brand without social media nowadays, but just because you have a strong, uh, a strong social media doesn't mean you have a strong brand, you know what I mean? 
um, if that was the answer. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, let's jump over to Leah before I give you the next question. Yeah, um, I think designing the, the main landing page of your YouTube channel can be pretty important for new customer acquisition, like new audience acquisition, because when a subscriber, when a viewer decides to convert into a subscriber, they need to know what you are doing in terms of the content, like what category you are, what kind of content do you put out there. So showcasing like the best video that's very catchy on the very main like teasing video is always a good idea to optimize the page. And also having a multiple like clear, clear and concise playlist displayed and showcased on the very first page is going to tell the audience that this is who I am, this is my content, and I can provide value to you, so therefore you should subscribe. Um, but I don't think you have much control over on the community page or other pages other than the very first page. Thank you, thank you. All right, so I've been very, uh, I've been very, I love this part of the panel. Um, people wanna know about your creative process so when you're in your genius zone identifying this frame this video frame for your audience i'm sure there are a million different things that you're thinking about so let's um talk a little bit about your process when it comes to selecting an idea planning it producing it and editing it until we actually get to finally pub publish it on your channel Sungyung, i am i'm very I have to say how much I salivate every single time I watch your videos. So I want to sort of figure out how do you choose your recipe and then all the work that goes into it, because you did kind of tell us that you are a one woman shop when it comes to doing this. Um, tell us your, your creative process. Uh, if, you are, if you are celebrating, I'm doing my job right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I am the type of person who needs a lot of inspiration to get one thing done. I, I'm pretty sure everybody is a little different about coming up with a new idea for the content, but I personally need a lot of inspirations. And to me, traveling uh, seems like the best source for me. Um, traveling different countries, different city, experiencing new things, tasting new things, seeing new things, that's definitely the number one source for me to get the inspiration. And when I'm the traveling, actually doing three things, not just only giving the inspirations, but it also reaches out, uh, I would say more wider audience that usually I cannot reach out by just sharing recipes. And being transfer, uh, to, transparent, transparent <laughs> and vulnerable helps having more, uh, get more together and tighter engagement with my peers. And also request, like I receive a lot of requests from my followers when I'm sharing my travels. So that's how I get all the ideas, um, what I'm gonna share next. And um, I usually choose the recipe based on who, which recipe people ask the most during my travel time. And I choose that and I share it. And before I actually filming it, I, I mentioned earlier, I do recipe testing because I believe and I experienced that quality of the information that in your contents is super important because people will notice uh, the quality level of in your contents and doesn't matter high quality and all that. I mean, high quality important, but doesn't matter how high quality it is, if your information is bad or not good enough as other out there, they're not gonna come back to you. So it's very important for long term, uh, long, long run of YouTube life because people will come back to you if you keep providing valuable, trustable information out there. So I always do recipe testing no matter what. And that's actually, to me, more important than actually what angle of camera I'm gonna use. <laughs> but um, I actually do film all by my, uh, not all by myself. 
I used to feel normal by myself because my husband is in military. So when he's going TDY and going different countries, I did a lot of things by myself. No one will believe it, but I did. <laughs> and I do edit my videos as well. But now I'm luckily, it's about the resourcing a game, but uh, outsourcing a game. But luckily, I recently hired my assistants, and my husband is retired. So we, three of us, we're living together. So I'm the director and the host of the show. So I do that part. I share my vision, how I want this uh, recipe to go, and they will do all the behind the camera jobs for me. And so we can be on the same page and creating that the most scrumptious, delicious, drooling motion <laughs> of a recipe video on YouTube. And when it comes to editing, I actually, um, I do actually watch a lot of Korean reality shows, uh, variety shows, and I get a lot of ideas of the humor or how to cook like a, I don't know, like a little, little design on your video. So I will keep update with nowadays style of videos. So I'm trying to watch a lot of Korean shows as well for my own show to kind of, you know, get the idea of the editing. That's, that's awesome. Um, let's move over to MJ. Because I think MJ, it's a little bit, you're, you're a special breed. <laughs> so walk us through your creative process from beginning until we get to watch it on YouTube. Oh, and your mic is on mute. <laughs> so choosing contents wise, um, it, because we're dance studios, we already like put we were learning uh, several dances every month. So I will normally choose my material from there, like contents. Uh, that's we, normally which is re uh, uh, requested by my students or viewers or followers. They normally ask, oh, next, next time, can you guys do this? So probably I will uh, look through the list and choose the one that uh, interested, uh, more interesting for me. Uh, personally, it's important to uh, like what you do for me. I, I, I do better job when I like what I do. So I'm sure it's gonna be the same to everyone. So I will choose the content that interests me the most. And also what's the most important thing is uh, what's the most popular uh, content dance out there at the moment. Uh, not necessarily I fall in love with it right away, but most likely when it's popular and when it goes to viral, there is a reason why. I make, sometimes it comes later to me, maybe because K-pop is more nowadays more teenage, like younger generation targeted uh, form. So uh, sometimes I do not understand right away, but when something goes viral, I kind of pick it up at the end, oh, this is the reason why everybody likes it. So I try to catch those trend and uh, select my material. So once I decide, oh, this is a dance cover that I'm gonna do this, this month, then uh, I have to choose my dancers. Because uh, my cover, my content requires a lot of help from, because it's a teamwork. So I have to choose select dancers first. And after that, we need to schedule the rehearsal, which is also hard because let's say I have seven members this time, then everybody has to come together and write down when they're available. So that's another challenge for me to come up with the rehearsal time. because We will have to meet four to five times a week uh, during that week to make the dance look nice. After dance is ready, we'll have to decide the costumes and where we're going to uh, film the video. These days, because uh, dancing in public is very popular, so we try to find a location that we can film without the permit. So that's another challenge right there. So after deciding all the concept, we actually go pretty detailed, your hairstyle, your makeup, your lipstick color, and who's gonna wear which uh, costume this time. So that takes some time to decide. And after that's done, uh, after rehearsal is done, obviously going into filming. Uh, filming normally takes about two to three hours. We probably run the dance six to seven times. Uh, sometimes uh, 
couple of wide shots and then medium shots and then close-ups and sometimes it requires special transition then we have to shoot that uh, separately so that's how filming goes after that's done editing uh, I'm doing it myself I, I have to kind of lay out everything and see which one looks great the group work is hard because let's say we have seven members if someone makes a mistake we can't use that clip so you have to really really carefully look through the older clips to uh, pick the best ones and mixing with wide shot and close-up is also very important how the transition goes in smooth so that requires a lot of work so editing is done then i'm sending my video to my videographer uh, he will color for me he will make uh, use a special effect to make it look cool uh, when that's done it will come back to me <laughs> And then I would decide, Leah actually mentioned it earlier too, it's very important to have a good cover photo because if you go to YouTube, there's a bunch of material, uh, contents out there. So you have to attract your audience right away. You have to make them click, hover over their mouse and click on my video. So deciding which, uh, which cover, uh, cover photo will look good and then what kind of uh, text that I'm going to use to make it stand out. But that's how you play the game like oh I, out of this whole page I have five videos i want them to look at mine first so choosing cover photo is actually pretty important too so when that's done it's on the public so people watch <laughs> oh that's amazing and i'm glad you actually covered that piece mj because i I feel like there's so much psychology that all three of you have to think about when you're trying to get the attention and right. our human beings attention span is not that long. So being strategic about what to click on um, is, is a very important advice to sort of share with the group. Let's um, pivot over to Leah on the same question and tell us about your beginning to end process. Yeah, I think for a lot of YouTubers who are doing it because they're passionate about the subject naturally has a tendency to come up with ideas without any problems, to be honest, because they're speaking to an audience who they know really well of. So for me, I know that like everyone who comes to my channel has either problematic skin, really oily skin, they want to have better skin. Like those are the three common themes. So being empathetic in with the audience is the key to coming up with good content ideas and <clears throat> i think i always always try to ask myself oh what would i search on youtube if i do have acne like what did the past leah do or what would what was she curious about to learn so I think if you ask those kind of key critical questions, it's easier for you to generate new content ideas and the contents that would resonate really well with the people who's actually looking for information. And if you are, you know, not having the most inspirational day, like there are a bunch of days like that, to be honest, too. So it's not like always butterflies and rainbows. Um, but in that case, analytics can really be helpful. You can go back to the YouTube analytics and numbers really don't lie. And you can see what kind of videos are trending. So trending meaning that um, generating like short term traffic in a short period of time. And there's always an evergreen like classic content that's that keeps generating traffic for years and years. So these could be more of an evergreen, like beginner, like 101 contents, like how to, you know, how to cleanse 101. So just being more strategic about by looking at numbers and analytics and the click rates and the watch time can definitely guide you into the direction of what content that you should be making. So just combining those two would really help. And for me, it helped greatly in generating content ideas. Um, once I do have a content idea and if it is very like science related or if it does have to do with the skincare chemistry, like the formulation chemistry or biology, like dermatology side of things, 
I would outsource the research part to my research assistants. So I do have three different research assistants. They're all in university or in their master's degrees studying biology, microbiology, and organic chemistry, and dermatology as well. So these are the students who are passionate about also spreading their knowledge um, through my YouTube channel as well. So they will be dissecting all the medical journals and researching the science behind skincare and the skin for me. And then I would summarize it and take out the key information that people should be should know. But my job as a content creator is to make that very complex and complicated information digestible and easily understandable. That's my only goal. It's not about what you what you deliver, it's about how you deliver that information that makes it stick. So for me, that process takes the longest because you need to find the right analogy. And if you're thinking of how do I actually visualize the skin reacting in this way, then what kind of prop do I need? Or can I use a dish sponge to kind of mimic the, I guess, the skin layers? Then I'll get the dish sponge and try to, you know, um, create a short B-roll for using those kind of props. And I think those visual information really does help um, that sticks well to the audience. Um, I think production wise, mine is definitely simpler compared to MJ's and also Sangyang's. I don't need to like go multiple angles and shoot with multiple different cameras. I definitely do respect that for those from those two. Um, it's a it's a pretty hard process it seems like um, but for me it's pretty straightforward and the post-production process I would do the rough cut editing and I would delegate or give that video to my designer who will be in charge of putting design or effects on top of those videos to make it more visually helpful and visually educational and yeah I think it that itself takes about a week and a week week or two and then I do have a Korean translator who um, transcribes the script and then who uploads the Korean subtitle on my YouTube channel so that takes another two days then it'll go live wow thank you um, I feel like all three of you had already touched up a little bit more on about sort of how leadership is so critical in your role um, whether it's the three-person team versus having the three researchers versus ha having the dancers and everybody shooting um, the dance frame. Um, did you, all, when you first started your business, and I'm going to jump in with you, Leah, did you know to have your researchers then? Or was it something gradually as you had to figure out how to manage time, you just couldn't handle all the the details to getting that perfect video yeah no at first it was just me like trying to educate myself to read scientific journals but i'm also not an expert in chemistry or biology and i knew that there are better people out there who are able to dissect those information for me and lucky enough there were a couple of subscribers who did reach out to me in the first place that, oh, they, they will be more than happy to do that process for me and want to work for me in delivering and finding information that would be beneficial for the viewers. And I think it's about like, when you want to take your content to the next level, you need those help who's from people who are smarter than you or who are, who are more specialized in the area than you. So I think through that, I've been trying to make key hires, but also um, it's not like they're a full-time employee. I don't pay them like on a full-time scale uh, by any means, but um, I do occasionally hire them as a part-time um, through topic, from topics to topics. Awesome. Um, MJ, tell us a little bit about, um, so you actually had to jump in as a team, you are the mastermind behind the team already. Um, what were some of the challenges or challenges that you ran into doing leadership from day one? Um, 
obviously it's a lot harder than working by myself because you have to consider everybody's schedule and their condition and everybody's interest uh, communication, everything is really hard. But very luckily, I am surrounded by awesome team members. They started with me like from the beginning. So um, I started with the team from the beginning. Obviously, it's a dance mm. video. I need other dancers. So my 2011, that was my first video. I still work with the same members. Um, there are a lot of new dancers actually jumped in to do uh, do more dance covers, but main members are the same. And uh, what's interesting is we didn't know what we were doing in the beginning. We were very naive and you know very new to everything. But throughout the time, uh, we built a special relationship as we were learning it together. And my dancers has improved so much as dancers. And my videographer, he became the best in the market. So over the time, we, we grew together. And what was the most challenging part as a leader was obviously it's very hard to make everybody happy. So there's always compromise, sacrifice that's required. Um, that's definitely more challenging than working by myself. But then at the same time, um, because we're more like a friendship, uh, I try my best to understand their difficulties, their schedules and everything, try to be extra cons uh, considerate for their situation. So, so far we haven't had any problems or issues um, all these years. They're nice people. So I was very lucky enough uh, to have a wonderful team. And um, yeah, so having great team is the, the blast, I think. Uh, creating contents, it, everything can come out from my brain, but at the end, if you want to grow, you need team members. And um, as a team leader, I would say um, what I did was I can confidently say I worked harder than any of my team members just to become a good example and motivation. And I guess uh, that dedication showed to my team and they're pretty like, respecting me as a leader so so far yeah that was my story <laughs> awesome awesome um sungyong you already talked about the team structure that you already have um and you mentioned about uh vision setting because you set the vision right um when your teammates look at you what what would you think they would say about like one awesome trait about sungyong being a leader in this space she made things happen. <laughs> uh, no, no matter what happens, no matter what circumstance I'm in, not only for the YouTube videos, I do a lot of dinner parties and pop-up restaurants and stuff like that. And uh, actually I do collaborate with other chefs and do the dinner events and uh, the winery and all the different places. And that is repeatedly uh, said from not only my team member, but like um, those other people that I work with before too. I, I guess that's the strongest part of me. Uh, no matter what you throw onto me, I will make it happen. I think I, I think I noticed that part, that quality of me is when I went a uh, TV show on Food Network and um, I learned about myself a lot and as a leader I think you really need to know about yourself so uh, and what you want so you can express to the team members and what they can expect from you and for the team and uh, for me I am very picky <laughs> and I'm, I'm very in, individual kind of person I can I do not perform the best when there's tons of people in the office I work the best and I perform the best and focus the best when I'm alone or only selected people in the office because uh, that's just just how my brain works so my teams know that they should not bring any <laughs> unrelatable topics that they to me when I'm focusing on something and um, that was a very tough for them but then it's very important to them to know so I can perform the best to, to keep this team going as well and so yeah um, 
knowing what type of a work person you are also very important. So if you if you think you work the best with the people, that's great, but just know yourself. Great, great advice. Reliability. You're very reliable and consistent. And I'm sure all of those traits are available in MJ and Leah as well. Um, before we open up to the Q&A session, I actually wanted to ask one last question to tie this panel back to what Carrie had brought up in the first session. So we've heard the, the nuts and bolts about how you started and how you maintain it. We wanna hear a little bit more about how do you deal with law and compliance? So Carrie earlier talked about protecting your own brand. Who has gone through, you know, registering a trademark or your logo? And um, if you want to just kind of share your experience around that, that would be great. Sun Kyung, do you want to go? Oh, sure. Well, I'm actually currently working on trademarking my uh, my company's name, which is Sun Kyung Longest Network. And I have not much really law issues with um, any other companies or brands out there. And so maybe it's a, just a type of industry I am in because of I'm in the food. And I was actually being really careful beginning of this uh, career that I will not even take a risk of not royalty free music or the music that I don't know where it came from or um, putting random people's faces on my videos or things like that. And um, so um, it has, there, there's been a couple of issues, but um, really have been that huge issue. And sometimes though, uh, I noticed a lot of people actually download my video illegally and they post it. And I, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, they actually warned you or letting you know that this person uploaded the same video to yours and stuff like that. And now the technology is so good on social media that they know who's the original, that who uploaded the first and who's, who owns the content. So they will notify you. But then uh, I was actually really pissed off that they are like stealing my work. But then I changed my mindset of like, hey, wait a second. I'm spending a lot of money and time to advertising my videos and my recipes. It's free advertising. They are doing all the work because um, I always make sure my video has a watermark of my logo and uh, that you cannot delete. And I always use the music nowadays that only my channel and uh, my Instagram, my account, only my account can use it and anybody else use it. They cannot do anything. Uh, they have to actually kind of turn down the video. So that little extra step actually helped as well to protect my uh, contents. But YouTube video wise, YouTube actually improved a lot for that category for, for YouTubers. So whenever somebody doing stuff that they supposed to not do, they will let you know. <laughs> Um, by show of hands, who uses the content ID feature that Carrie had brought up in the first session? Nobody. All right. <laughs> Maybe we should ask Carrie after this session. <laughs> um, Leah, so tell us a little bit about what you've noticed in your space. Yeah, so. Uh, a lot of copyright claims are pretty similar, the music usage and whatnot, but definitely one of the things that has been a hot topic in the beauty community is the abiding the FTC guideline when you're working with brands or when you got gifted the products to use in your videos, you need to disclose that relationship that you have with the brand in the description box or you need to publicly state it so that your audience or the viewers know that you, this product is gifted or you have a specific paid or unpaid relationship with the brand. And a lot of the times like 
people got away with it, but I think the FTC guidelines, more viewers and more people know about it. So they tend to call you out if you don't disclose it. So it's very important to state that this is a paid promotion and you need to tick the box in the advanced feature on YouTube when you are advertising the product. And since I do have my own personal skincare brand as well, I always do have, I always have to disclose the relationship that I have whenever I'm bringing in my skincare products to be featured on Leah Yu's channel. So just abiding and really knowing the FTC guidelines as an influencer when you are working with brands, I think that's becoming a very sensitive topic to the public and definitely a responsibility that every influencer should know of. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that tip. Um, MJ, we, you've already mentioned earlier that you, you shoot your videos in places where you don't have permits. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me a little bit about, like, I'm curious about the music piece, right? The music okay. piece is a very challenging thing because yes. you're doing a cover. What have you noticed in your space around using the music or doing filming in places that where you're not actually getting a location release for? So um, music wise, uh, obviously it, they don't belong to me. So uh, there were a few times uh, my video got muted or taken down because I was using I was using someone else's work, which is sad because you put so much time effort to make the video and you don't get to share with people. Uh, but these days, because uh, a lot of people are actually making dance covers, which help those artists promote their music and dance, uh, they're less strict about it, a little bit. So when I just dis simply dispute the video, sometimes it just come back to my channel and I can play again. Uh, but definitely there were cases my, my contents were taken down. So I couldn't do anything about it. But then very recently, um, I was contacted by this third party uh, company who work with a lot of uh, YouTubers, uh, help them promote their channel or work with them or connect them with the actual artists themselves to collaboration work. Uh, they mentioned that um, they could uh, buy copyright to certain music and help us to clear that. And obviously there will be share of um, the profit if we make it. But then dance covers, uh, they mentioned dance, dance, dance cover videos, they don't, it's gonna be very hard to become your main, main income. But then what you can do is you can uh, use this platform to promote your other business. That's what I'm doing. So. I, I, the reason why I'm not calling myself self YouTubers is because I currently, I'm not currently making profit out of my YouTube channel, but then it's not, it's not direct, but indirect directly, I've been using YouTube to promote my dance company, dance studios. I have a bunch of, a lot of students coming in and say, oh, I've seen your videos on YouTube and uh, I, I've had a lot of requests perform or doing workshops because they found out about us through YouTube. So that's how I've been utilizing my YouTube channel instead of just trying to make profit out of my dance videos. But then this third company, uh, third party company, um, they actually mentioned me. Did you know a lot of, uh, there are people in China using your video and they actually create a channel. <laughs> so I'm like, oh really, I didn't know about it. So they're probably waiting for me to make videos so they can use it. <laughs> So they told me that they can also um, uh, take care of those issues as well, legally. But then the reason why I'm doing, uh, I don't look at it as a bad thing, actually. I think uh, Sungyeong mentioned it too. They're promoting my video <laughs> there for me. So only thing, I'm not looking into, uh, go into the process to claim that that money has to come to me. Uh, other than that, what I would like to do is I want to make sure that I use that route to promote my dance even more than uh, my channel more. So that's what I'm looking into right now. Uh, definitely music, using music is always an uh, issue for me. Uh, they don't belong to me. But then I'm finding my way to kind of work around it. Uh, those, there are companies out there who knows that we have great contents where we have passion, we have, we are passionate for our contents, but we don't, 
uh, know anything about how to clear the copyright. So they, they are, there are, are companies out there who are willing to work with us. So I'm looking into it right now. Um, if the, and the reason why I decide to go into it now, I know it's been years that I've been making my videos. I never look into it. But um, the reason why is that I, it, even though I only have 276 subscribers, I do have a lot of views. Like I have video has 10 million views. I have 4 million, 1 million. There are a lot of videos over a million views. And for me like, oh, and I do put a lot of efforts in it. And my team puts a lot of, a lot of effort in it. It's fun. I want to continuously do it. And uh, why, why wouldn't I look into it more and turn into something better? So that's what I'm trying to do right now. If there are people who's doing dance related stuff, too bad because music don't belong, unless you compose your music. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult to make profit, but then they can be a very, very good platform to do something else. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. Or outsourcing if you wanna go that route. Yeah. But it sounds like, um, it's great that nobody has been sued and you haven't had to sue anybody else. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and both for Hong Kyung and Leah too. But like sometimes like videos, locations, because we don't have a permit, like you mentioned, like you asked, I forgot about it, but um, there were times I got stopped. While I'm, yeah. I'm filming, they come, the security comes, oh, you can't be here. In Grand Central, I was filming. There's a lot of fun episodes, <laughs> like filming the Grand Central security comes, like, what are you doing? Do you have permits? So that happens, but that's, that uh, have been becoming my fun memories. <laughs> and uh, luckily nothing happened, but these days uh, dancing in public is pretty common. So they're very much open uh, to it. Yeah. So, yeah. You're a risk taker. <laughs> I love it. So I want to be mindful of time. I can't believe the whole, uh, a little bit more than an hour actually just flew by. But I want to take the next, um, the next four minutes to open up to Q&A really quick and um, let our audience know that they can send in their questions. But to cue that off, let's, let's address the, the obvious that everybody's experiencing now. Um, and Tong Kyung had alluded to this earlier about how she shifted her business with the pandemic in the quarantine journey. Um, why don't we, why don't we go back to Sungyong because you had mentioned that you were, you shifted your business, but I think what we want to hear about right now is how have you been personally impacted because of the pandemic? A lot. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody's life has probably just turned upside down, not only me, but whole entire world. And what I've been focusing on is keep doing what I am able to do at home. And I was very lucky, and a lot of YouTubers are the same way, that we are very lucky to have a job that we can work at home, no problem. And actually, during this pandemic time, internet businesses, a lot of YouTubers probably felt it too. Like the views went up, the subscriber numbers went up, everything just increased so much because people are spending a lot of time um, on their phone because they have, I don't know, like a whole lot of more time than they used to. So um, I shifted a little more of sharing. At the time, I actually came back to regular routine, but I shifted my uh contents to more of those easy to make recipes with like how to make asian style pasta with the spaghetti that you have or um how to use canned tuna or stems things like that to now i'm um, came back to all traditional recipes because things are a little loosened up but um we actually moved from uh, during this time too, and it was a huge challenge for us moving, holding our, our company and personal life, pick up and move this far, far away of the States. And it was pretty much a challenge as well. But, um, oh yeah, the one thing we actually did during the pandemic time too, we did a live stream on Facebook, Instagram, and sometimes on YouTube. 
because Facebook and Instagram is so much easier doing live. And uh, we did a live every single day for 62 days. And I really believe during that time, my viewers and my followers and not only me, but also my husband and my assistants, we, all three of us and all my viewers are like, got like this. We got so close because every single day we chatted, we cook together, we drink together, we just having so much fun together. And so that was a great time. And that, will, that was actually, I would say, um, turned my viewers and my relationship to take to the next level. It definitely did. I'm sorry, Jenna, I couldn't hear you. I was on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is 8 p.m., but I want to make sure that we get to Leah and MJ before we close out the panel today. Leah, how, how, how has the pandemic impacted you? Well, the positive thing is I started cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with the stay at home order, I think a lot of people are, you know, researching recipes. So I'm sure Sungyung has gained a lot of followers during this time. Um, but same with me, YouTube traffic has definitely increased by, I think, 30% was it. And it impacted, like positively impacted a lot of digitally native businesses, digitally native creators like us. So it's a huge blessing in disguise. I think what has impacted me in my personal and professional life is more of the supply chain with my product business because of the COVID. Uh, a lot of the supply chain in South Korea has been impacted, delayed. They were prioritizing creating hand sanitizers and more of the essential products. So our production got delayed and delayed and the logistics as well, like the air shipping and the ocean freight has, has been impacted by large. So yeah, definitely the business side, like the beauty brand side has been impacted. But on the YouTube side, it's been pretty positive. <laughs> great, that's great. MJ. Um, for me, it's been hard because uh, I wouldn't be able to gather my dancers to have a rehearsal during this uh, corona situation. So uh, I'm opposite of it. It will be hard to create any content at the moment as a group. Um, and also my business wise, uh, luckily we were able to conduct our class online through Zoom. So we're currently running our business through online. Although it, the classes definitely got smaller and there's some difficulties that I'm going through. Um, for YouTube, uh, although I won't be able to, not that I used to create content that frequently, but uh, it got worse at the moment. But I learned uh, during this hard time, you can be a little bit more creative and you can kind of reuse your old contents, kind of uh, re-edit and come up with different, uh, like updated contents as well. So I have... Uh, used a couple of old videos that I didn't post up or um, like behind the scene and stuff like that. You can definitely use it during this time. So I can, I, I would say uh, during this difficult time, you can also uh, be more creative and try to find the sunlight. <laughs> Um, my pandemic journey speaks for my haircut. <laughs> I had yeah, long I hair and I chopped it all off. <laughs> oh, it looks really oh. cool. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to thank everybody. Thank you, Sung Kyung. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, MJ, for joining us tonight. It was a very riveting discussion um, for, I think, the aspiring entrepreneurs out there who want to make their next business and brand on YouTube. Um, I do hope for, for the audience tonight that you loved it. And if you loved what you saw with Carrie and us, that I highly encourage you to watch it again, take notes and share it to your friends. You will be able to find this webinar again on the koreasociety.org website, as well as COTRA, the New York IP Desk YouTube channel. And, you know, of course, we just have to 
to thank our hosting organizations, Korea Society and COTRA for making tonight's panel happen. So thank you so much for your precious time, Sungkyung, Leah, MJ, and Korea Society and COTRA. And I also wanted to thank the audience who tuned in tonight. Thank you. Thank you Have a wonderful mm -hmm. night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.